Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John J. Mearsheimer, who is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He's the author of numerous books, including Conventional Deterrence, Liddell Hart and the Weight of History, and The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. John, welcome to Berkeley. Glad to be here, Harry. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Brooklyn, New York uh, in December 1947, just as the Cold War was getting started. <laughs> uh, and I was raised uh, in New York City until I was eight years old, uh, at which point my parents moved to the suburbs. Uh, they moved to Westchester County, Croton, New York, uh, where I grew up. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your character? Uh, that's a very interesting question. My parents were actually not at all interested in politics, mm. uh, so they had almost no influence on pushing me into political science and the study of international relations. That all came much later in life. I think what my parents taught me was to be very honest, uh, to be what uh, they used to call a truth teller, uh, and also to work very hard. My parents had very old-fashioned values and they believed that God put you on earth to work hard. Uh, and they instilled uh, the value of hard work and the value of truth-telling in their children. And I think that's had a significant effect on me uh, over the years. Were there any books that you uh, read as a young person that, that really affected you? I would say that there were a handful of books that I read uh, when I was in my late teens and early 20s uh, that had a significant impact on me. Uh, one in particular was David Halberstam's The Best and the mm. Brightest. Uh, I grew up during the Vietnam years. In fact, I was in the American military from the years 1965 to 1975, which was coterminous with the Vietnam War. And I often used to say to myself in those days, how in God's name did we get into this horrible war? How did it happen? And I think reading David Halberstam's book, which I think provides a very powerful and cogent explanation, had a very significant uh, impact on my thinking. Now you did your undergraduate work at, uh, at West Point. How, how did you wind up there? I went into the American military in 1965. Uh, I went into the Army, uh, and I was in for two years. Uh, and at the end of that first year as an enlisted man, uh, I had two choices. One is I could go to West Point, or two, I could go to Vietnam. <laughs> uh, and uh, what happened in those days was that they often looked at people who were in the Army uh, and those who were in the Army, enlisted men in the Army who had talent, they would offer appointments to West Point, and that's what happened to me. Uh, and I at first decided I'd go to Vietnam. I did not like uh, the military at all, although I spent 10 years of my life in the military, and I'm mm -hmm. deeply appreciative of that experience. Uh, I actually didn't like the military as an institution. Uh, I don't like shaving. Uh, I don't <laughs> like sleeping in the woods. I actually don't like guns. I don't like uniforms. I don't like authority. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing about the military that I found congenial to my basic personality. Uh, but anyway, my father uh, greatly wanted me to go to West Point. He was deeply convinced that uh, I should do that. And when he heard that I was thinking about not accepting the appointment to West Point and instead going uh, to Vietnam as an infantryman, mm -hmm. uh, he basically gave me compound fractures of both arms uh, <laughs> to go to West Point. So in what ways was the military a positive influence, if any? What, what did you take out of that experience that proved useful later in life? Well, I think I learned a lot of things in the military. First of all, I just learned a lot about the subject that I now study mm -hmm. from having been in the American military. If you do international relations and you focus on military strategy and the use of force, there's no question that having been in the American military uh, provided me with a lot of experiences and a lot of insights that I think helped me in my later work. But on a more personal level, uh, I think that West Point uh, prepared me to be uh, a scholar uh, in uh, two very important ways. First of all, West Point taught you to suffer. Uh, it taught you to work hard, uh, to uh, be able to deal with the adversity that comes with producing scholarship. Many people look at a book that a scholar writes or an article that a mm -hmm. scholar writes and they think that this person just sort of sat down uh, and in a few hours, uh, in the case of an article, or in a few weeks in the case of a book, uh, produced this terrific piece of scholarship. In fact, as you well know, mm -hmm. uh, it takes years of hard work uh, 
to produce a first-rate piece of scholarship. And uh, it's often very painful. In fact, it's almost always very painful to write mm -hmm. uh, a really good book. Uh, and it requires a lot of suffering. And I think West Point taught you to get up every day and to wrestle with the bear. Mm -hmm. uh, and even when it looked like things were not going to work out, to nevertheless get up out of bed and, and go to work. So that mm -hmm. was w one very important lesson that it taught me, the importance of hard working and fighting through adversity. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, West Point taught me uh, to tell the truth and mm -hmm. to, uh, it placed a very high emphasis on saying things uh, that might go against the conventional wisdom that people might, might not want to hear just because it was the truth. So I think uh, I learned there to sort of speak my mind even if people didn't like what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important quality in an academic uh, as how, well. How did it affect you being in the military uh, at, at, the, at the time of the Vietnam War when uh, 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 there was uh, so much despair about that war and the military's uh, role in it? It was very tough to be at West Point when I was there. I was there from 1966 to 1970. Uh, I graduated on June 3rd, 1970, and if my memory's correct, Kent State took place on May 4th, 1970. Mm. So those were definitely tumultuous times. It was difficult to go home uh, at Christmas or during summer vacation because we all had very short hair, mm. and virtually all the kids that I grew up with who were then at college had long hair. Many of them had been radicalized and very much opposed to the Vietnam War, and saw me as somebody who was a symbol of the establishment and therefore the enemy. Uh, probably some of my most searing experiences uh, during those years were marching in Armed Forces Day parades in New York City. Mm. Uh, every spring we would go to New York City and we'd march down Fifth Avenue uh, on what was called Armed Forces Day. And uh, invariably in the later years, the let's say 68, 69, and 70, uh, there would be huge numbers of demonstrators uh, on either side of us as we march down Fifth Avenue, oftentimes throwing bags of pig's blood, plastic mm -hmm. bags filled with pig's blood or urine uh, at us, spitting at us, screaming at the top of their lungs. Uh, and we oftentimes, before we went, had extensive drills on how to deal uh, with the crowd should it charge us and mm -hmm. uh, try and get to the American flag which we carried uh, in our midst. Uh, so those were very difficult times for a young person uh, to be at West Point. Uh, what did you learn about the military uh, as an instrument of political power that you got from that experience? Anything in particular? Well, I think I learned a couple things. First, I, I learned that militaries tend to be rather conservative institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, many people think, uh, especially people who've had no affiliation with the military, that, uh, that military officers like war. They like to mm -hmm. go fight. Uh, in fact, I think the exact opposite is the case. Uh, and if you think about it, it makes good sense. It's those people who are going to get shot uh, mm -hmm. or killed uh, if they get sent to war. So the military, generally speaking, is quite reticent about fighting wars. It's very rarely the case that military officers are clamoring uh, to get a shooting war started. That was one thing I learned. The second thing I learned is that there's a great deal of corruption in the military, mm -hmm. as there is in any large institution, whether it's the Catholic Church or the academic world. Uh, the military had its share of corruption. And I think this was especially true during the Vietnam War, which I think had a corrupting influence uh, on the military. So those were the two principal things I think I learned about the American military from my experience. Now you, uh, in the end, became a uh, international relations theorist, uh, somebody who, who uh, 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 works on strategy and who can be put in the realist camp. Uh, I, I'm curious as to what it takes to do this kind of work before we talk about what it is you do. What exactly do you mean when you say what it takes? It, well, what sorts of skills other than the ones that you've already mentioned? I mean, is it is it is it uh, 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 what 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 uh, kind of thinking? What kind of preparation for that thinking is 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 uh, 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 something we should talk about? Well, I've given a lot of thought to this question, and it's a fascinating issue. Uh, I think, by and large. 
uh, theorists, IR theorists, are born, not created. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you either have an instinct uh, for creating theories or you don't. It's very hard to take people who don't have those proclivities uh, and to turn them into a theorist. And I think uh, to be a theorist, you have to be creative. You have to be willing to invent new ideas, number one. Mm -hmm. Two, you have to be willing to make arguments that are likely to be controversial and therefore cause all sorts of people uh, to come after you hammer and tong. Mm -hmm. uh, and number three, I think you have to know a lot of history. Uh, to be an IR theorist mm -hmm. uh, of some consequence. You have to have thought long and hard about how the world works because what you're doing is trying to come up with an explanation that can account for a large part of international politics. And if you haven't thought long and hard about how the world actually works, it's hard to imagine how you could come up with a theory that could explain the world. So I think these different characteristics are, are essential uh, for someone who wants to be an IR theorist. And the first two are, I think, not learned. Mm -hmm. uh, they're sort of born into you. They're hardwired into you at birth. Third, you can learn. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you were a realist. So help us understand what the uh, uh, essential features of a realist theory are. Uh, is and uh, or are and uh, then what your particular take on the the realist theory is well realists are individuals who believe that the state is the principal actor in, in international politics and furthermore they believe that states are very concerned with the balance of power and pretty much everything that states do uh, is connected to how uh, the behavior uh, that they're taking at any particular time will affect their position in the balance of power. Uh, and when you talk about the balance of, balance of power, you're really talking about military power and the use of military force. That's all bound up with this concept of the balance. Uh, so realists tend to be people who pay a lot of attention to the use of force. They focus on things like deterrence and war fighting and the impact of nuclear weapons on international politics and so forth and so on. So I think those are the key ingredients that all realists share. Uh, my view is that there are basically three kinds of realists. Human nature realists are realists who believe that states, like individuals, are hardwired at birth with a will to power in them, and that states constantly compete for power because it's an innate phenomenon. Uh, Hans Morgenthau is the most famous human nature realist. Who came from the University of Chicago, or who was at the University of Chicago. Who was at the yeah. University of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, where you are now. Where I am now, right. Uh, and then the second school of realist thought, or what I call the defensive realist, these are people who believe that states behave uh, somewhat aggressively because the structure of the international system forces them to compete for power. It's not that states are hardwired with this animus dominandi, as mm -hmm. Morgenthau calls it. What drives states is the fact that the best way to survive in the system is to be very powerful. And every state understands that, and therefore they compete for power. Witness uh, how the United States and the Soviet Union behaved during the Cold War. Uh, these defensive realists, however, tend to believe that states only want a limited amount of power because they understand that too much power is a bad thing. Kenneth Waltz, who is probably the most famous living realist theorist and who was a famous professor here at Berkeley for many years, I think is the archetypical defensive realist. Waltz believes that states do compete for power, but it does not make sense to want too much power. I agree with Waltz that structure determines how states behave. In other words, it's the structure of the international system that causes states to and compete for power. It's the anarchical system that they have to operate in. Yeah. That, yeah. It's an anarchical system, meaning that there's no higher authority yeah. that sits above states. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have a 911 problem. If a state gets into trouble in the international system, it can't dial 911 mm -hmm. because there's nobody uh, on top to come to their rescue. And it's this anarchy. 
uh, that pushes states to compete for power. So Waltz and I agree on that. But the fundamental difference between the two of us is that I believe that states seek hegemony. I believe that they're ultimately more aggressive than Waltz portrays them as being. And the goal for states is to dominate the entire system. To put it in colloquial terms, the aim of states is to be the biggest and baddest dude on the block. <laughs> because if you're the biggest and baddest dude on the block, then it is highly unlikely mm -hmm. that any other state will challenge you simply because you're so powerful. Just take the Western Hemisphere, for example, where the United States is by far the most powerful state uh, in the region. No state, Canada, Guatemala, Cuba, Mexico, would even think about going to war against the United States because we are so powerful. This is the ideal situation to have, to be just so powerful that nobody else can challenge you. But Waltz would argue that it's not a good idea to be so powerful because when you push in that direction, other states balance against you. They try and cut you down at the knees. And, and you really believe that the key to understanding uh, the U.S. role in the world today is that we are really the only uh, state that has hegemonic power uh, in its own region? My argument is, Harry, that it's impossible for any one state to be a global hegemon, mm -hmm. to dominate the entire globe. The globe is just too big, and there are huge power projection problems associated with the bodies of water that separate mm -hmm. the various regions of the world. In other words, for us to go on a rampage in Asia and conquer huge parts of Asia would involve projecting power across this giant moat called the Pacific Ocean, and it's just not going to happen. So. I argue that what states can do is they can become the hegemon in their own region of the world. In other words, you can become a, he a regional hegemon, not a global hegemon. But then furthermore, what states want to do is make sure that there are no other regional hegemons on the face of the earth. In other words, they don't want to have a peer competitor. And, and the reason for that is what? That they are concerned that uh, 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 another regional hegemon would inevitably try to interfere with their backyard? Yes, that's right. Let's take the United States, for example. The United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. The United States does not want a regional hegemon in Europe, whether it's Imperial Germany, Nazi Germany, or the Soviet Union, because it would fear that if that state had no competitors in its region, it was the dominant state, it would be free to interfere and form alliances with states in the Western Hemisphere and possibly threaten the security of the United States. So from the American point of view, the best situation that you can have in Europe is for there to be two or more great powers that focus most of their attention on each other and are therefore much less concerned about what's going on in the Western Hemisphere. So the United States over time, I argue, has gone to great lengths to make sure that there is no regional hegemon in either Europe or Northeast Asia, the two areas of the globe where there are other great powers and ergo there may be a potential peer competitor. Now, now, the argument you're making is what you wanted, namely controversial, and uh, uh, before 9-11, uh, it was even more controversial. So let, let's look at some of those arguments. The, the Soviet uh, 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 Union falls, uh, uh, the Berlin Wall comes down, uh, and before we knew who Osama bin Laden was because of events in uh, uh, New York City on 9-11, on it, it looked like the world was going the other way. We were looking at globalization. We were looking at the movement of people and money. Uh, and it, it looked like a global culture and society was emerging. And, and the states were really uh, 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 losing their power. We were seeing the decline of the nation state or the state power, which is critical to your theory. What, what was your argument then and what is it now against that argument uh, being made uh, 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 against your theory. Well, there's two arguments here. One is that the state was disappearing, and the second is that uh, cooperation was replacing conflict as the dominating feature of international politics. And let's take them one at a time. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think that there's no evidence that during the 1990s, and certainly now, that the state is disappearing from the face of the earth. The fact of the matter is that the most powerful political ideology in the world today, and it's been the most powerful political ideology in the world for two centuries, is nationalism. And nationalism glorifies the state. 
state. And there are all sorts of peoples out there fighting for a state of their own. The Palestinians are just one example of that, right? So the state is here to stay uh, for, for the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, now, with regard to the argument that cooperation was rep replacing conflict as the defining feature of international politics, I think that there's no question that there was less conflict among the great powers mm -hmm. during the 1990s than there was during the rest of the 20th century when you had World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. But the principal reason for that was the architecture of power that you had in Europe and Northeast Asia with the end of the Cold War. When the Cold War ended in Europe and the Soviet Union collapsed, you were left with this remnant state called Russia that was remarkably weak and in no position to cause any trouble. The other potential great powers in Europe, Britain, France, and especially Germany, were in no position to cause any trouble because the United States had 100,000 troops stationed in Europe and was sitting on top of those states throughout the 1990s through NATO the way it had sat on top of those states from 1945 to 1990 during the Cold War. So it was the American pacifier in Europe and you have basically the same situation in Asia where you have the American pacifier there. You have 100,000 troops in Asia as well, most of them in Korea and most of them in Japan, sitting on top of some of the most powerful states in both of those regions and preventing them from fighting with each other. And China and Russia, which are the two states that the United States are not, is not sitting on top of, are both so weak that they're in no position to cause any trouble. But nevertheless, I would remind you that we have fought three wars since the Cold War ended. We fought a war against Saddam Hussein in 1991. We fought a war against Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia in 1999. And we fought a war in Afghanistan last year. And in fact, that war is still going on. So despite the fact that there has been not much conflict between the great powers, there has been uh, a great deal of conflict in the world, and the United States has been involved in at least three of those wars. Now, why is it so hard uh, for the United States to buy in to a realist theory of the world and a realist explanation of its own behavior? Well, uh, realism has two real problems with it for most Americans. First of all, realism has a very pessimistic view of international politics. It says there has always been conflict, uh, there is conflict today, and there always will be conflict. And there's not much you can do about it. This is what I call the tragedy of great power politics, which mm -hmm. is the title of my book. The second point that realists make that most Americans uh, find repugnant is the idea that you can't discriminate between morally virtuous states and malign states in the international system. For realists, all states are basically black boxes that behave the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, if the United States has to be ruthless, the United States will have to be ruthless. That's the argument that realists make. Now, Americans are fundamentally liberals at heart. They believe in progress. They're products of the Enlightenment. They're people who believe that through hard thinking and skillful policies, it's possible to solve the world's problems. That somewhere out there in the future, it's hard to say where, we can create a more peaceful world. That is in contrast to the pessimism of realists. And American liberals, and when we talk about American liberals, we're talking about the vast majority of Americans, therefore dislike realism for that reason. The other point that Americans believe in is the idea that our country, the United States, is a highly moral country. That we behave according to a different code of conduct than most, uh, most other states. In the Cold War, for example, there were good guys and bad guys. We were the good guys, and the Soviets were the bad guys. Realists, on the other hand, don't discriminate between good states and bad states. They're just states. And a realist explanation of the Cold War would say that the United States and the Soviet Union were both equals, and they behaved according to the same rules, because the structure of the system left them with no choice. That's perspective that most Americans recoil at. Now, in, in addition to this uh, uh, dilemma for Americans to understand 
uh, the way the world really works and, and the way that policymakers actually make policy, uh, th there is the added difficulty that we're doing this in a democracy, right? So it, 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 your theory and what you've just said suggests that our leaders are always not putting all their cards on the table as they get elected and debate the issues. And, and w w how does that problem affect the way we behave in the world? Well, we behave in the world according to realist dictates okay. on almost yeah. every occasion, right? Mm -hmm. What's affected by the point you're making is our rhetoric, yeah. right? In other words, we act according to the dictates of realpolitik, but we justify our policies in terms of liberal ideologies, mm -hmm. right? So what is going on here is that in many cases, elites speak one language, right, and act according to a different logic and speak a different language behind closed doors. Now to unpack this a bit more, there are some cases where the dictates of realpolitik and the dictates of the idealism that is so attractive to most Americans line up perfectly. For example, in the fight against Nazi Germany and the fight against the Soviet Union, the logic of realism pointed in exactly the same direction as the logic of idealism. So it was not difficult for American elites to justify the war against both Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and against the Soviet Union in terms of idealist rhetoric. And it was completely consistent with what we were doing. The really tricky cases are when the United States has to form an alliance with a repressive regime right, or go to, against a, go to war against a state that it thinks is quite progressive. And then realist logic points in one direction and idealist logic points in another direction. And in those cases, what the United States does is it brings out the spin doctors and they tell a story to the American people that makes it look like what the United States is doing is completely consistent with its ideals. A perfect case in point of this is how we dealt with the Soviet Union in the late 1930s. Uh, in the late 1930s, Stalin was viewed as a murderous thug, and the Soviet Union was widely considered to be a totalitarian state. But in December of 1941, when we went to war against Nazi Germany, we ended up as a close ally of the Soviet Union. So what we did was bring the spin doctors out, and Joseph Stalin became Uncle Joe, uh, and the Soviet Union was described as an emerging democracy, and we made all the necessary rhetorical changes to make it look like we were aligning ourselves with a burgeoning democracy, because Americans would find it very difficult to tolerate a situation where we, in effect, jumped into bed uh, with a totalitarian state that was run by a, a murderous leader like Joe Stalin. So we cleaned up. So what, what is the implications of this for the notion that we try to uh, uh, conduct our foreign policy in a democratic system? Because on the one hand, I'm hearing you say that uh, our politicians do not lay all their cards on the table. But then on the other hand, uh, uh, they are uh, acting in ways that they cloak what really is governing their action uh, in, in liberal uh, uh, democratic terms. I guess that's a long-winded way of saying how should people examine their leaders in an electoral process in a democracy when it comes to the conduct of foreign policy? Well, I think that they should tend to be very skeptical to begin with. I think it's very important for uh, students uh, of foreign policy uh, to be skeptical about what their leaders say, regardless of the country that you mm -hmm. live in, regardless of whether it's Bill Clinton or George Bush who's running American foreign policy. We should all be very skeptical mm -hmm. uh, of what our leaders say because they have powerful incentives to mislead us on occasion. Not always. As I said before, there'll be cases where uh, they're giving us the straight poop, but mm -hmm. there'll be cases where they have an incentive to uh, mislead, and we want to be aware of that. Um, second point is, I would pay more attention to what states do rather mm -hmm. than what they say. Uh, and I think if you look at the behavior of states and mesh it with the rhetoric of the leaders, you'll often find a real disjuncture there, and those are the cases where you want to examine things much more closely. What are 
are the particular responsibilities of a strategist uh, and an IR theorist uh, as they get involved uh, in the policy debate uh, in their own country? I know one of your, your books was on the, the British strategist uh, Liddell Hart. And, and what, what did you learn from that study about uh, the dilemmas that confront a strategist uh, and keeping the debate honest uh, as it relates to national security and foreign policy. Well, what I learned from that case, and also from a handful of other cases that I've studied and thought about over time, is that in a democracy, it's very important to have individuals uh, who have the freedom to say whatever they want. And if you look carefully at most people who speak out about American foreign policy or about German foreign policy or British foreign policy, you can pick your country, most of them are constrained in what they can say because they're beholden to certain institutions. Oftentimes it's the state. As you know, in German universities, right, your appointment as a professor uh, was dependent on uh, the state. Uh, these were all state-run universities, so you had to be very careful what you said when you were a German professor for fear you might run afoul of the government. The beauty of the American system uh, is that we have all of these private institutions and even public institutions like Berkeley where with the tenure system professors are free to say whatever they want and suffer hardly any consequences in terms of losing their job. Therefore, I think we have a very important responsibility to talk about important issues and to challenge conventional wisdoms that other people might be unwilling to challenge. We have a real social responsibility here. One thing that bothers me greatly about most political scientists today is that they have hardly any sense of social responsibility. They have hardly any sense that they're part of the body politic and that the ideas that they are developing should be articulated to the body politic for the purposes of influencing the public debate and particular policies in important ways. They believe that they're doing science and science is this sort of abstract phenomenon that has little to do with politics. In fact, I think exactly the opposite should be the case. We should study problems that are of great public importance, and when we come to our conclusions regarding those problems, we should go to considerable lengths to communicate our findings to the broader population so that we can help influence the debate in positive ways. I'm not making an argument here, by the way, for coming up with particular answers to important mm -hmm. questions. Right? And in fact, if different scholars come up with different answers, fine. But in a democracy like the United States, you want to, very, you want to have a very healthy public debate about the key issues of the day. And I think that scholars can go a long way towards making that debate richer and healthier. Let's look at two problems and see if we can tie some of these uh, uh, problems together. Terrorism, that is something that we were confronted starkly with after uh, the blowing up of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Twin Towers by the uh, hijacked planes and the Al-Qaeda uh, terrorists uh, in control of the planes. Uh, what sort of a problem is terrorism in the, in the eyes of somebody who is a realist, who does international relations theory, and, and what do you have to say about the way the government is conducting the war against terrorism? You know, there are a lot of different questions yeah. embedded in, in, <laughs> yeah. in that let's one. Let's unpack question. them. Yeah. Yes, let's unpack yeah. them. Uh, first of all, it's very important to emphasize that terrorism was a significant problem uh, before 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, in 1993, Al-Qaeda tried to blow up the World Trade Center. They just failed on that occasion. And we, the United States, had been the victim of terrorist attacks by Al-Qaeda on a, more than a handful of occasions uh, in the 1990s. What made what happened on 9-11 so important was that they proved beyond doubt that they were not the gang that couldn't shoot straight, which is what they we thought was the case before 9-11, right? And when we realized just how competent and dangerous they were, we then began to 
hypothesize what might happen if they got a hold of weapons of mass destruction, in particular if they got a hold of nuclear weapons. So the terrorism problem has been with us for a while, and most IR theorists have spent some time thinking about it. But what has changed over the past year is the magnitude of the threat. We understand that we're up against a much more formidable and much more dangerous adversary than we thought was the case throughout the 1990s. So that's point number one. Point number two is the question of what does a realist theory of international politics have to say about terrorism? The answer is not a whole heck of a lot. Realism, as I said before, is really all about the relations among states, especially among great powers. In fact, Al-Qaeda is not a state. Mm -hmm. It's a non-state actor, or what's sometimes called a transnational actor. And my theory, and virtually all realist theories, don't have much to say about transnational actors. However, there is no question that terrorists and terrorism is a phenomenon that will play itself out in the context of the international system. So it will be played out in the state arena. And therefore, all of the realist logic about state behavior will have a significant effect on how the war on terrorism is fought. So realism and terrorism are inextricably linked, although I do think that realism does not have much to say about the causes of terrorism. Now the final issue that you raise is the question of uh, what I think of how the Bush administration is waging the war on terrorism. My basic view, which may sound somewhat odd coming from a realist, is that the Bush administration's uh, policy is wrong-headed because it places too much emphasis on using military force to mm. deal with the problem and not enough emphasis on diplomacy. I think that if we hope to win the war on terrorism, or to put it in more modest terms, to ameliorate the problem, what we have to do is we have to win hearts and minds in the Arab and Islamic world. Look, there's no doubt that there are huge numbers of people in that world who hate the United States. And a significant percentage of those people are willing to either sacrifice themselves as suicide bombers or support suicide bombing attacks against the United States. What we have to do is we have to ameliorate that hatred and we have to go to great lengths to win hearts and minds. And I don't believe that you can do that with military force. Uh, I think some military force is justified. If you could convince me that Osama bin Laden and his fellow leaders are located in a particular set of caves in Afghanistan at this point in time, I would be perfectly willing to use massive military force to get at those targets and to kill all of the Al-Qaeda leadership. But I think in general, what the United States wants to do is not rely too heavily on military force, in part because the target doesn't lend itself to military attacks, but more importantly because using military force in the Arab and Islamic world is just going to generate more resentment against us and cause the rise of more terrorists and give people cause to support these terrorists. So I'd privilege diplomacy much more than military force in this war. And I think the Bush administration would be wise if it moved more towards diplomacy and less towards force. Let, let's look at another problem, and that is uh, the future relations uh, with the People's Republic of China. Uh, this uh, seems to uh, be an area that, that you've written about, and it, it, uh, your theory suggests that it, it may uh, have applicability uh, there. Uh, uh, how should we look at China uh, as it emerges as a potential hegemon in, in the Asian theater? Well, the most important question about China is whether or not it will continue to grow economically over the next 20 or 30 years uh, the way it's grown over the past 20 years. Uh, it's almost impossible to say 
whether or not China is going to look like a giant Hong Kong from mm -hmm. an economic perspective in, in the year 2030 or not. It's just very hard to say. My argument is that if China continues to grow economically, it will translate that economic might into military might, and it will become involved in an intense security competition with the United States, similar to the security competition that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. That intense security competition, in my opinion, is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, why do I say that? My argument is, as I emphasized to you before, that all states like to be regional hegemons. They like to dominate their backyard and make sure that no other state can interfere in their backyard. This is the way the United States has long behaved in the Western Hemisphere. It's what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. Well, if China continues to grow economically and militarily, why should we expect China mm -hmm. not to imitate the United States? Why should we expect that China won't want to dominate its backyard the way we dominate our backyard? Why we should we expect that China won't have a Monroe Doctrine when we have a Monroe Doctrine? Now, if China tries to dominate all of Asia, which I expect it will do for good strategic reasons related to realpolitik, the question you have to ask yourself is, how will the United States react to that? Well, again, as I emphasized before, the United States has long wanted to be the hegemon in its own region and to make sure that it has no peer competitors. Well, if China becomes a hegemon in Asia, it is a peer competitor by definition. My argument is that the United States will go to great lengths to make sure China does not become a peer competitor. It will go to great lengths to contain China and cut China off at the knees, the way it cut Imperial Germany off at the knees in World War I, the way it cut Nazi Germany off at the knees in World War II, the way it cut Imperial Japan off at the knees in World War II, and the way we cut the Soviet Union off at the knees during the Cold War. The United States has a long and clear record of not tolerating peer competitors in either Asia or Europe. And therefore, I think there's no reason to believe that we would tolerate Chinese hegemony in Asia any more than we would tolerate Japanese hegemony in now, Asia. Now, what, what, what does that mean? What, what do you think we will do or we should do uh, to prevent that inevitability from coming about? Well, there's two things I think that we'll do. One is I think that we'll go to considerable lengths uh, to slow down Chinese economic growth once it becomes apparent that they're headed towards the Hong Kong model. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not exactly sure what policies we'll pursue. And I tend to believe that it will be almost impossible. I don't have a lot of hard evidence to support this, but I think it will be almost impossible to slow down Chinese economic growth. It will be impossible. will be almost it's impossible. impossible yeah. Yeah, be very difficult, yeah. uh, at the very least, uh, to slow down Chinese economic growth. Uh, the second thing that we will do, which I think will be more effective, is that we'll put in place a containment policy, mm -hmm. similar to the containment policy that we had against the Soviet Union in the Cold War, to prevent China from actually dominating Asia. And the balancing coalition will look like this. It will be Japan, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Korea, India, Russia, and the United States. And you can already see the first stirrings of that balancing coalition. Uh, the fact that the United States and India, who were not rivals, but basically uh, soft adversaries during the Cold War, the fact that those two countries have now moved much closer to each other and are much more friendly with each other uh, is, I believe, due to the common threat of China. Uh, and I think you'll see the same thing happening with Russia. I don't think Russia-American uh, relations uh, will be as uh, bad uh, over the next 20 years as they were during the 1990s, in large part because a growing China will push us together. Now, what, what particular form or, or what particular action will these alliances take? In other words, is the worry here that, that China will be on the move militarily and, and these coalitions will stop it? I mean, what what... What form will this balancing take? Will it be political? Will it be cultural? Or what? It'll be mainly uh, political and military. Yeah. Uh, 
just to give you a couple examples to highlight the potential problems that are out there, uh, there's a dispute between Russia and China as to exactly where the border is between them. But more importantly, there's been massive illegal Chinese immigration into Russia. Uh, and it is possible that a border dispute could break out between Russia and China uh, at some point in, in the distant future. Uh, the United States, I think, will go to great lengths to back up the Russians and to prevent that from happening because the United States would not want a situation where China conquered any large portion of Russian territory. Uh, to take another example, Japan, as you well know, is an island state that's highly dependent on imports and exports that come across water. Uh, therefore, the Japanese are very concerned about uh, the sea lanes of communication or the sea lines of communication uh, that uh, they're so dependent on. Uh, the Chinese, on the other hand, uh, troll those same waters. In the scenario we're describing, they're sure to build a very large navy. And the Japanese and the American navy on one hand and the Chinese navy on the other hand mm -hmm. are likely to move about in places like the China Sea. Uh, and one can hypothesize all sorts of scenarios where they crash into each other. Uh, another important issue, which I won't talk about at any length because it's so obvious, is Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably going to be the case that Taiwan is not incorporated into China in, in the next five or ten years. It may happen, but certainly not likely. Uh, what happens if China becomes big and powerful and doesn't own Taiwan? At some point, they're probably going to use military force to take Taiwan. And it may be the case that both Japan and the United States say that is unacceptable and go to war on behalf of Taiwan. So you can hypothesize all sorts of scenarios. Let's hope they don't come to fruition. But you can hypothesize reasonable scenarios where a powerful China runs heads long into a powerful United States. Uh, the argument uh, on the other side by the people who believed in the emergence of international institutions uh, was in, in some sense an idealistic, and is in some sense an idealistic argument, you know, that, that certain values, uh, whether it's human rights or whether it's uh, inter the values of international uh, commerce and capitalism will take hold and offer a brighter future uh, than realist theories uh, 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 offer, however compelling their logic. The question I have for you is where if, is there in realism a place for values and, and the realization uh, of those values uh, in the world? Uh, because at, at one level, uh, realism can sound very mechanistic. You know, that there's a, a, a logic here, and it's very hard to deviate uh, from uh, 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 that logic. And, and there doesn't seem to be a place for normative structures, for example, the universalizing of, of human rights and so on. Any comments on that? Or? Well, I am sad to say that I think that your description of realism is an apt one. <laughs> and that is to say that there is not much place for human rights and values uh, in the realist story. Uh, realists basically believe that states are interested in gaining power, uh, either because they're hardwired that way or because it's the best way to survive. And they don't pay much attention at all to values. Uh, there's a new book out by Samantha Power that uh, everybody should read that deals with the question of how the United States reacted to all of the principal genocides of the 20th century, the most recent of which is the Rwanda crisis of 1994. And the central conclusion that she reaches is despite all the rhetoric in the United States over time about our willingness to fight on behalf of human rights. Our record is an abysmal one. And if you read her chapter on how we behaved during the Rwanda crisis, mm -hmm. it will make you sick to your stomach. Here was an administration, the Clinton administration, that was filled with people who extolled the virtues of human rights regimes and the importance of the international mm -hmm. community intervening to prevent mass murder and so forth and so on. In the event, 
right, when there was evidence pouring in that a genocide was taking place in Rwanda, a real genocide, uh, they behaved in the most despicable fashion, right? And this is consistent with how we have behaved over time. The fact of the matter is, as I said to you earlier, states talk a good game when it mm. comes to values, but they actually behave in a very real politic, a rather cold and calculating manner when the money is on the table. Now, what does this tell me? This tells me that if you're interested in survival in the international system, the best way to survive is to have your own state and mm. to have lots of power and not to depend on the international community. The Jews learned this lesson very clearly. This is what Zionism is all about. The Jews understood that as long as they didn't have their own state, they were at the mercy of other states or of states that had a lot of power and could beat up on them. And that when they dialed 911 or they thought about calling in the international community, there would be nobody at the other end. So they got their own state. Now the Jews are whopping up on the Palestinians. The Palestinians are getting very little help from the international community, right? Mm -hmm. When they dial 911, there's nobody there at the other end. Not surprisingly, the Palestinians are desperate to get their own state. So the basic lesson I take from studying international history over time is that it makes sense if you're interested in surviving if you're, you as a people are interested in surviving, to have your own state and to be as powerful as possible. What advice uh, would you give uh, to students who might watch this tape uh, uh, as to how they should prepare for the future? Well, my view is that students should read widely. Uh, and they should look at all of the competing theories that are out there that attempt to explain how the world works. Uh, as I've tried to make clear here, uh, there are a number of realist theories about how the world works. Morgenthau is different than Waltz, and Waltz is different than Mearsheimer, right? And I'm different than Morgenthau. These are three very distinct realist theories. Then you have a whole body of liberal theories and theories that have been devised by social constructivists that explain in very different ways than realism how the world works. I think students should pay very careful attention to all of those theories and get them deeply embedded in their brain while at the same time looking carefully at how the world works, looking at the historical record, right? Looking at what happened in the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the Cold War. And they should constantly be running all of those different theories that they've studied up against the historical record to determine for themselves which theories they think best explain the world. I always tell students, my goal here is not to make you a realist. I'm going to give you my view on how the world works. Hopefully, many of you will think that my theory is a powerful theory. But if you don't and you come to different conclusions, so be it. But the important point is you want to be open-minded about all the theories that are out there, especially for young students, right? Not old codgers like you and I who have already figured out what our <laughs> theories are and are now attached to them for all sorts of different reasons. These are young people who have an opportunity uh, to play around with all sorts of theories and to run them up against the real world to come to their own conclusions about how they think the world operates. Uh, if uh, students watching this, what, what suggestions do you have about the lesson they might learn uh, from your intellectual odyssey? Soldier, theorist, uh, 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 and, and so on. Well, there's two lessons I would take from it. One is that it's almost impossible to figure out uh, <laughs> how you're going to end up uh, wherever you end up, uh, somewhere down the road. Uh, the world works in very funny ways, and uh, I never imagined when I was a young boy training myself to be a professional athlete, or when I was a cadet at West Point, that I would become an IR theorist someday. If somebody had told me that uh, in, say, 1964 or even 1970 when I graduated from West Point, I would have said that that person should be taken away to the loony bit, right? <laughs> I just did not think it was in the cards. So one never knows uh, where he or she is going to end up. That's point number one. Point number two is one thing I've learned over time is that it's important to have lots of different life experiences and to expose oneself to all sorts of different situations and different theories 
uh, and different kinds of people because it provides you with all sorts of insights about how the world works. You don't want to be narrow in your learning experience. You want to be wide ranging. You want to absorb tremendous amounts of information and you constantly want to be running it through your brain to see how well the theories that you have in your head about how the world work, works, how they mesh up with the real world. The key point to remember here is that all individuals have theories in their head. We understand the world in terms of theories. And what we have to constantly be doing is upgrading and improving our theories. Because the theories that we have when we're 20 years old, many of them we junk by the time we're 40 years old because the world doesn't work according to those theories. And people want to be conscious of this interplay between the theories they have in their head and the real world and pay very careful attention to that phenomenon. And then one final question. What should students get out of an undergraduate uh, uh, education that helps them along the path that you just described? Out of a graduate education? No, undergraduate. Out of an undergraduate education. Well, again, I think that if you're an undergraduate, what you want to do is you want to take a lot of history courses mm -hmm. and uh, you want to familiarize yourself with let's call it the empirical database. Right? You just want to know a lot about history and a lot about the politics of the day. Uh, in fact, you want to read the New York Times uh, or the Wall Street Journal uh, or your local newspaper and, and you want to read widely. And then the other point that I would make uh, is that you want to take a good number of courses where they teach the prevailing theories uh, in the various sub-disciplines. You want to take courses in American politics, for example, where you get the principal theories. You want to go over to the sociology department and you want to take courses where the principal theories of the day are laid out and the same thing is true with international politics. Again, I think there's no substitute for having a wide-ranging knowledge base and there's no substitute for being familiar with the theories of the day because that will help you refine your own thinking, help you fine-tune those theories that you have in your head, maybe even abandon certain theories that you have in your head and adopt new theories. As you well know, mm -hmm. we all go through life and we reach certain junctures along the road where we junk mm -hmm. theories that we once thought were tremendously powerful. And that's because we get introduced to new ideas that give us a much better uh, grasp on life and, uh, and we also sometimes run into evidence that contradicts the theories we have in our head. So I would say to students that what you want to do is you want to make sure right, that you expose yourself to lots of theories and to lots of history. John, on that uh, positive note, uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.